Hi, and welcome back to COM 309, Health Communication. Today we're going to be talking about caregiver communication. It's chapter three of your book. I'm going to hit the things that I think are important at least. Um, I won't be able to cover everything, but these are just the things that really stuck out to me when I was going through the chapter, and I'd like you to uh, focus a little bit on two. Um, first of all, what is a caregiver? If we're talking about caregiver communication, um, contrary to the, the things we were talking about in the last lecture with providers, a caregiver is somebody who doesn't get paid and probably doesn't have any special training in actually administering health care, right? This is just somebody who takes care of somebody who's sick or needs some sort of supervision or, um, or physical or mental healing, okay? Um, they can provide all different types of roles. Usually they provide a lot of them, um, including not just physical support, but also emotional support. They also might act as a patient advocate, you know, um, being a liaison between providers and the patient. Um, if the patient isn't up to doing it themselves, um, which is very often the case because they are, after all, the patient. Um, they might also have um, all of the financial planning that goes along with different types of medical bills or um, you know, funerals, whatever, social events as well. Um, really, it it's, can be kind of like an all-encompassing job, but again, for people who aren't getting paid for it, they're doing it usually out of the good of their heart or some sort of obligation because they're friends or family. Um, I I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but um, after listing all the different things that caregivers do, I think it's obvious that um, this could be a very, very stressful job. Um, not just because of all of the different time-consuming tasks that are required um, of a caregiver, but also because of what's going on um, in the relationship between the caregiver and the patient. Um, different roles could be being reversed. Um, I know that uh, the research on um, uh, marital satisfaction between caregiver and a patient. So if you're taking care of a spouse, uh, marital satisfaction tends to decrease. Um, uh, likewise, um, think about the different turmoil that can come up when a, uh, a child starts taking care of a parent and you have that role reversal on top of whatever stresses are going on from uh, the, the illness itself or, or whatever happened to um, require caregiving to begin with. Um, this is the only thing I want to sort of emphasize with this is that we're going to be talking for the rest of the time about how um, caregivers can be better, but the truth of the matter is caregivers need social support too, and that's an important area of study for people who, who focus on this exclusively in health communication, trying to figure out how to um, support the caregiver so that they can be better at what they do, okay? Um, <clears throat> some of the problem areas that come up in, in caregiver communication. So uh, this could be caregiver communication between the patient or even in that liaison role with providers that I was talking about before. Um, well, one thing is pain, right? A lot of times people are giving care to people who are in a lot of pain and pain complicates things, um, both because it, it's very emotional, right? When people are in pain, they handle it differently and people, hand, uh, people experience pain differently too, which um, might make it harder for people to empathize with somebody who's in pain because they, they really don't get it. Um, but it, it could also be complicated by the fact that um, when somebody's in pain, it's hard to explain that pain to somebody else and then have them explain it to somebody else. So if you're trying to help somebody get um, pain medicine, for, for example, it's very hard to uh, explain to a, a doctor or a nurse what they need, right? Because it's it's not actually happening. Um, there's also a lot of problems with willingness to communicate um, in, in these areas, and we'll talk more specifically about this in a minute, but um, there's taboos that are, are surrounded in, in healthcare situations in general, especially when we're talking about things like illness, especially terminal illness, because we don't like talking about death. Um, people also don't like to communicate a lot in, in, about serious matters um, in these situations because they're afraid of burdening somebody. The patient might not want to burden the caregiver more. The caregiver might not want to burden the patient with stressful conversations. So the problem with that is that people don't communicate about some things that they should communicate about. Um, and there's also a lot of guilt and shame that could be uh, wrapped up in um, how people see their roles, right? Um, if you're seeing yourself as the sick person who's being taken care of, you might have guilt and be reticent to talk about different things because of that. Likewise, if um, the caregiver is having some sort of survival guilt or something like that, right, it could um, also factor into how willing they are to communicate about certain issues. So that can be a barrier. Um, and then again, as I've already sort of mentioned, emotional support is really important in these interactions. Uh, and, and now we're sort of talking about 
the role of the caregiver in providing emotional support to the patient, but it's not so easy. Um, we'd already mentioned before, sometimes when patients are in pain, they're, they're very emotional, they can be very irritable, they could be on medication. There could be all different types of reasons that their personality isn't the same, which makes it difficult to empathize with. But also, it's a time-consuming job. It involves active listening. Um, it involves putting all of your stresses aside, which tend to be elevating, right? If you're doing all the things that you normally do, plus taking care of another be human being and coping with whatever illness or, or um, condition right, um, is making it so you need to be a caregiver to begin with. Um, a lot of caregiver communication research focuses on um, end-of-life care um, caregiving, and I really like the discussion about um, hospice care and palliative care in your textbook. Um, the differences between the two can be a little bit nuanced. I'm going to start with palliative care, which um, is sort of this interdisciplinary approach to pain management, essentially. Um, it, it's not about curing somebody or getting rid of a disease like chemotherapy, right? It, it's about taking care of somebody's pain, which again, we've already discussed, can be a barrier to different types of communication. Um, it is very interdisciplinary, so um, it might not just involve, right, physical, um, uh, it might not just involve, like, physical medicine, right? It could also involve spiritual, um, counseling, those types of things. Um, relatedly, we have hospice care, which is really, a, in, this involves end-of-life care. So this is um, what ideally would happen when somebody is diagnosed with a terminal illness that they know is probably going to be there, right? Um, it's not going to be something that can be cured. People might be moved into hospice care. And like palliative care, it's very interdisciplinary. The emphasis is on pain management, right? But um, now it's also because it's on um, management of end, end of of end of life decisions. Um, so um, somebody who goes to hospice care, right, it wouldn't just be about giving them pain medication. It might also be uh, giving them counseling for making different types of end of life decisions, bereavement counseling for their family, right? So it's a very holistic approach, a systems approach even. Um, to the end of life experience, because really it's not just about the patient in hospice care. Um, hospice care often has a lot of services for the families too. Um, <clears throat> and, and I should just point out, right, I, I, I get the impression from your book, right, they're talking about hospice care is almost a, a sort of a solution to a lot of communication problems that could arise in either um, uh, situations where there's um, high levels of pain, um, well, in the case of palliative care, or um, situations in which it's the end of life, uh, in which the end of life seems inevitable and decisions have to be made, um, emotions have to be sorted through. Um, this is sort of a, a service, a place where some of those communication issues can be worked out and people that work there are especially trained to do that. Um, okay, I'm gonna go, um, I'm actually going to come back around to the older adult section in a second, but since we're already talking about hospice care, um, let's talk about some of these issues that your book mentions about um, uh, sort of the, the communication problems that can arise with death and dying. Um, first of all, we as a culture don't like talking about death. I shouldn't even say a culture. I bet most cultures are like that, though I don't know that. Um, mortality is not an easy thing to talk about, and so when we do it, we tend to joke about it. Um, but the problem with that is that uh, when the end of life actually comes knocking on our door, um, if we're not willing to talk about it, then uh, all sorts of misunderstandings, stressful situations, um, painful emotions, regrets, all these different problems can arise because people might have to make split decisions that they hadn't thought about before, or they might have to make decisions on behalf of a loved one that they haven't consulted with their loved one before. Um, so one of the reasons is, is, again, there's just sort of like this taboo about talking about death, it makes people very anxious. Um, it's especially uncomfortable if you're talking about somebody else's passing, right? Because it's it's not even yours. Um, so, um, uh, Another problem is with the physicians themselves. Um, I actually didn't realize, um, it, your book mentioned after we had that whole, you know, discussion last time about how the doctors don't get a lot of communication training. Um, they do get some training about talking to people about um, end-of-life decisions. Um, but it sounds like even 
with that training, they're still very anxious to bring it up. So it's like there's knowing how to do something and actually feeling motivated or comfortable enough to do it. So there seems to be still a barrier about doctors willing to talk to patients about this. Um, another good point uh, is that doctors tend to have an optimistic bias um, when they see when, when, with their perceptions about how other people see death. Um, your book, actually, I'm not going to go through them, but it brings up um, a couple of different ways or philosophies that people could have about death. Some people um, are going to, like, say, no, I, I want to live no matter what, you know, it doesn't matter how painful or, you know, uh, what, what the outcome is for my family. Other people are more like, I've accomplished everything, this is my time, I want to go, what, whatever. So there's a couple of different philosophies for really, but whatever. Um, doctors, however, really that first one I mentioned is what they tend to go into the communication situation assuming um, that their job is to save lives and that everybody wants to be saved no matter what. Um, the problem with that, even though that's great, especially if you have that philosophy, <laughs> um, is that it, it, it might not present options to um, people who are making decisions um, about it might not present what their options are, right? The doctors might not even bring things up because they're sort of assuming that everybody wants to, you know, fight tooth and nail until the very last minute. Um, so again, uh, all of this could be problematic because if people don't talk about um, things like advanced directives, which are, are, are you know, um, often legal, right, directives about what you, you state ahead of time, uh, what should happen to you if you get in a situation where, for instance, you can't breathe on your own and things like this. Again, these are that's the point. These are nasty issues, right? Nobody likes to talk about them, but if they don't, um, then it can cause a lot of stress and conflict um, when those decisions have to be rushed. Um, okay, uh, finally, I want to talk about, uh, your book talked a lot about um, older adults and the communication issues that can arise when you're dealing with this population of people. Uh, one pet peeve, which you've already heard me say, is that your book um, often uses the term elderly. It's not really PC anymore. Um, a older adult is what you say. It's sort of relative, right? It's like, well, I'm younger, you're older, right? Elderly, right? W w think about what it connotes. Frailty, right? Uh, it's elderly. Um, and, and it's that language um, that sort of hits at one of the special challenges with this population, which is that because people have all of these assumptions about what it is to get older, and they're usually negative, we tend to t treat older adults very negatively. Um, this is kind of like why language is important, right? Um, some of the great examples that uh, was, was in your book was about how, um, well, think about, it's true, some older adults are hard of hearing. Um, but that doesn't mean that they have any cognitive deficits. But if you find yourself talking louder or having to talk slower, right, so that somebody can follow what you're saying, um, you start to treat them as if they maybe aren't so uh, competent in the communication department. You might even withdraw. And um, so one of the sort of challenges is um, called the communicative pr uh, predicament of aging model. I was trying to think of it, communicative predicament of aging model, uh, which is essentially just saying that um, there's this vicious cycle of uh, maybe there's some sort of communication impairment. Um, maybe think about um, stroke victims. A stroke victim has a hard time talking um, because maybe they've lost some of that capacity, but um, cognitively they're fine. You just have to give them a little more time. But when you see them interacting, you get the impression that they're not so with it. So then you start treating them like they're not so with it, or maybe withdrawing entirely. And this ends up leading, for the person who's struggling to communicate, um, loneliness, depression, all sorts of really negative outcomes, and it actually might dampen their communication. So it could be like sort of this vicious cycle. Um, again, that's a communicative predicament, because it's a predicament um, of aging model. It's kind of like you can't win. Um, some other stereotypes and assumptions we make that um, all uh, older adults are, are senile or, or, or have dementia. We're not saying dementia, of course, isn't a factor, but this association with age and cognitive decline affects how we treat older adults, and that can um, really have some bad outcomes for their treatment. Um, and uh, they even the book even brought up, I thought, I made a note, like this can affect physicians too. Physicians might not recommend that older adults get exercise, for instance, which would actually be very good and prolong their life because of the sort of assumptions that they're elderly, that they're frail, right? They can't um, be subjected to so much strenuous act such strenuous activity. Um, another um, interesting sort of barrier 
um, that happens uh, with older adults and, and um, that can cause complications with caregiving um, is polypharmacy, which is that if people are being diagnosed with more and more illnesses, with more and more conditions, they're going to be taking more and more medication. And it gets confusing. And here's another time when this issue of health literacy comes up. Um, Nobody has the same level of health literacy that a, a pharmacist does, unless you're a pharmacist or a doctor does, unless you're a doctor, right? Um, and here, patients, you know, end up with like a whole pharmacy in their cabinet. Not only that, but the, the, they'll have drugs, but then they'll have also like the, um, the, the generic brands of the drugs. And keeping all this straight can be difficult, in my opinion, even for younger adults. But with older adults, they, they tend, they might have more. So this is a more relevant problem, I think. I don't think it suggests anything about their cognitive functioning. It's just hard to keep up with all this. Um, and so some of the solutions to this is um, doctors will ask um, patients to bring in their pills so that you can, <laughs> so that they can actually tell what they're taking instead of asking them, which wouldn't be a reliable source. But this can obviously cause a lot of problems with treatment. Um, and, and it can cause a lot of confusion um, among the adults who are actually you know, taking these medications and might get confused about what they're supposed to take and when they're supposed to take it. Um, and finally, um, there's this issue of institutionalization. Uh, your book says that, and this was not a recent statistic, 25% of adults over 65 die in a nursing home. That's a quarter. That's a quarter of this older adult population. Um, and what's sad about it is that these institutions tend not to be great places for caregiver communication. Um, there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, one of them is the staff, and I'd say the staff is a huge one. Um, this, the staff at these homes, which are privately owned, tend not to be um, trained very well in this type of care. Um, they also are overworked and underpaid, um, so they might have more than they um, they can manage um, on their plate, and of course they're not feeling very appreciated. Uh, and, and this is not a good motivating force, um, especially for, we already talked about, caregivers already have a very stressful job. Okay, sorry, those aren't caregivers, they're providers because they're taking care of them, but the point is, is taking care of somebody is very stressful anyway, um, especially um, if your working conditions are not that great. Um, another problem, um, getting back to those stereotypes we talked about is, uh, with older adults, um, is uh, baby talk. Uh, some studies of nursing homes have found that um, staff tend to talk to uh, the patients like they're babies. Um, so think about how when you talk to an older adult, you know, maybe you get a higher pitch voice and call them sweetie or what it like their children. Um, the problem with that is it's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy and um, very competent older adults can actually sort of read into the language that's being used to them and the tone that's being used to them and then actually become less capable of whatever they are doing. Um, and finally, this is what makes me so sad, this concept of interactive starvation. Um, these are places that don't have a lot of so uh, that, that the residents don't have a lot of social interaction. Part of that's because a lot of the uh, residents do have some form of dementia, um, which complicates communication situations. Some of them are bedridden, so they don't get up. Uh, and again, we have staff that are overextended, so they're not getting much interaction with them either. So it's sort of like this um, social wasteland. Um, and all of this could be, again, uh, lead to a very sad and lonely existence. And of course, um, it make it so that uh, different types of important healthcare communication doesn't happen. Um, on that really depressing note, oh my god, I think that covers it. I'm really sorry, I'll just say this, uh, the videos are going kind of long. These chapters are so packed and I can't shut up about it. But I hope it's helpful. Um, if I can, I'll try to get a little bit better at keeping these to closer around 15 minutes. So, all right, I uh, guess I'll see you for chapter four. Bye.